how many times this past year and a half or so have you found yourself muttering, you have got to be kidding me. Or here we go again, or when it rains, it pours. How many times have we wondered how much more pressure could there be? Could just one more thing go wrong? Have you ever found like when your washer goes, your microwave goes the same week or the same week that your, your son wants to pierce 95% of his body is the same week that you get evaluated at work and are found wanting. How is it that these things can so often coincide? We are week three now into our tempted series where we're examining the different kinds of temptation, three kinds, and that knowing the difference between the three kinds of temptation can make all the difference in how we overcome those temptations. Why is that important? Because every regret we have can be traced to giving in to a temptation, at least one temptation, whether it was giving up on that friendship or I shouldn't have said that, I knew I shouldn't have said that. When we look back on our lives, the regrets that we have can always be traced to temptation, somehow giving into temptation. And so we've been looking at how to reduce the amount of temptation we face by looking at the different kinds of temptations that we encounter. So we talked about the first kind of temptation, which is common temptations. These are the kind that seize us, not because we're particularly bad, but because we're human. And we've talked about the best way to overcome a common temptation is just flip it upside down, right? If you're being tempted to curse someone, to wish ill on them, what do you do? You bless them. You pray for them. If you're feeling tempted to feel prideful, you humble yourself and so on. If you're tempted to lie, tell the truth, this is how we deal with these common temptations. This is the back door. This is the way of escape that God promises will be in every common temptation we face. Then last week we talked about the kind of temptation we fall into. And these are the kind of temptations that we face because we've given into smaller temptations that eventually amount to bigger ones. We've given into foolishness, which puts us in a position where now we're faced with immorality, right? And so we got to learn to turn these upside down. How? Just don't be dumb. That was basically it. If you make wise choices, you will face fewer of these temptations that you can fall into. So don't be dumb. That was the second temptation. The last kind of temptation we're going to talk about today in this series, we're going to wrap it up, is the kind of temptation that God leads us into. And yes, God leads us into temptation. The first person I shared this with after I discovered it in scripture, because it's so clear, is kind of probably common to the rest of us. You could probably relate to their response. They're like, I don't like that. I don't like that. there's something wrong with that. This just doesn't feel right. But we have to understand that there are temptations we face because God leads us into those situations. So we're going to talk about that today. Now, those of you that are resisting that thought, like, no, no, God would not lead us into temptation, you're probably thinking of verses. You're going, where's that one, that one about God doesn't, yeah, it's right here, James 1, 13. And you're absolutely right. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. Why? For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. And I'm not going to take that apart and put it back together in such a way that it doesn't say what it clearly says, because I, I want you to hear this. God doesn't tempt you. God doesn't tempt anyone. God cannot be tempted. This is not how he works. But God leads us sometimes into temptation. And that's very different than actually doing the tempting. I know this because his own son Jesus, when instructing his disciples on how to pray, told them, and it's coming to you now, make sure you pray this. And by the way, part of the prayer says, give us today our daily bread. So it's a today prayer, a daily prayer. So he's saying every single day you're going to want to pray in addition to daily bread and forgiving and all that, lead us not 
into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Why would Jesus say, you're going to want to talk to the Father, and you're going to want to ask him not to lead you into temptation, but actually to deliver you from evil. If, if God doesn't lead us into temptation, then this is a nonsensical prayer. It's a throwaway line. It means nothing. And then the deliverance part would also mean nothing. So there's something here, and he would know. <laughs> Not just because he's the Son of God, but because God led him into temptation. So I want to show you this. In very early, if this is actually just before his ministry began, Jesus, it says, was led <laughs> by the Spirit, by God, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He was led into a situation where the express purpose of that season in the desert was to be tempted. Now, God is not tempting him. Who's tempting him? The devil's tempting him, but notice that God led him into temptation. Are the wheels of your mind spinning going, how can this be? It's actually super important that we understand that this is what was going on, because if God is leading us into the temptation, he can lead us out of the temptation. It's really un, uh, important to grasp. Now, Jesus is not the only one. You might be thinking, well, that's just clearly because he's an archetype, he's the savior, this is unique. Yeah, except it happened to Peter as well. So right on the eve of Jesus' arrest and betrayal, Jesus pulls Simon Peter aside and says this. He says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I've prayed for you, Simon. Let's pause there. Now, could you imagine this conversation? Hey, Peter, yeah, what do we want? Um, Satan came to me. No way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he asked me something. What did he ask you? Well, he asked me, Peter, whether he could sift you like wheat. And now, you got to know that sifting wheat happens in three specific stages. It's a very involved and thorough process. This is not a pretty picture. Satan's asking basically to take you apart, you know, bit by bit and to put you through a sieve, right? Over and over again. And so you can just imagine Peter going, he, he, he asked you that? And, and Peter probably, as Jesus was speaking, was going, <laughs> would you tell him? And Jesus says, I told him yes. I told him yes. Okay, wait, what? You, you told him yes, what? Well, he could sift you like wheat. Well, why? And, and he says, well, it's okay, Simon. Okay, because uh, I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. That word fail doesn't mean falter. It means stop, to cease. I'm praying that your faith is not destroyed. But when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. He allowed Satan to do something in, in Peter's life to attack him, to tempt him, to sift him so thoroughly that it was, would result in Peter falling away for a time. But knowing that he would come back because he prayed for him that he'd come back, his faith would and fail and then when when that happens come back and strengthen your brothers now I need to point out that the reason Peter is facing this particular attack and temptation is because he's following Jesus it's not because he's being stupid it's not because he's somehow blown it he's facing this temptation because he's following Jesus this isn't just New Testament, it's Old Testament. Have you ever thought of Job? In fact, that line comes up very quickly in the book of Job. Job's entire catastrophic loss and the, the grief and the destruction wrought upon his life were a direct result of following God closely. Look, in fact, in the book of Job, the, the angels and Satan are appearing before the throne. It's kind of like a staff meeting in heaven. I'm not sure why Satan's invited, but he's invited. He shows up. And look at this. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? 
There is no one on earth like him. He's blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Why is Job being tempted? Because he's awesome. (laughs) Because he's fearing God. Because God's purpose for his life is coming to pass and the devil doesn't like it. But God brings Job up. God is the one who led Job into the situation that would cause him so much pain. So clear that some temptations arise because we're following Jesus and we present a threat to Satan. Now, again, I'm not asking you to like that idea, but I am challenging you to accept it because it's clear from the word of God that this is true. We're going to get into why God does that again, uh, or why God does that uh, in, in just a little bit. But here's what's at stake. Here's how you can picture what's going on. Let's, let's look at this picture. Let's say God is leading you upwards through a series of challenges, maybe increasing difficulty. And his his intention for you is that you would experience breakthroughs, that you would see answers to prayer and miracles, that you would make an impact and there'd be a reward that you would be able to taste now and fully uh, embody and experience later. The enemy noticing that you are on this path, that you are committed to walking it, that you are going to be making a difference. You're going to make an impact, that prayers are going to be answered. The kingdom is going to come as you follow Jesus, then gets in your way. He presents opposition and temptation to prevent you from experiencing those breakthroughs, those answers to prayer, those miracles, the fruit and impact, and then experiencing any kind of semblance of reward so that he can discourage you. Why? He cannot afford you to get there. He can't afford for you to make that kind of difference and prove here on earth that God is worthy of trust. He cannot allow that to happen. So the moment any of us take God seriously, the enemy comes in our path and and brings opposition. This happens when people get baptized and they go on record, they make a public declaration of their faith. Remember that baptism is a symbol of Jesus flaunting, oh, this person's identified with my death. They've identified with my resurrection. You can't touch this. You can ha- can't have this one. So the enemy then brings opposition and says, well, then I'm going to stop them from following you. Now, the Apostle Paul, as he is teaching his new converts, his new disciples, how to follow Jesus. He's begging for them to forgive each other as the Lord forgave them. Uh, why? He says in 2 Corinthians 2.11, In order that Satan may, might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Uh, full disclosure, when I, when I read this, I'm like, well, maybe you're not unaware of his schemes, but I think most people kind of unaware of his schemes. I think often we are outwitted by the enemy. Remember those stupid temptations we give into that tank our life and it's because we started doing something stupid or unwise and then we're tempted to do something immoral. So how, how is it that Satan does outwit us? How, how, come, how come he can get a hold of us? I think sometimes we don't step back and look at the bigger picture of scripture and what we can learn from the temptations and trials and attacks that others face so that we can then look at our own struggles in a different light. So this is what I want you to know today. This kind of temptation, the kind God leads us into, as opposed to the common temptations everyone faces or the the temptations we fall into due to our own lack of wisdom and stupidity, This kind of temptation, the ones God leads us into, if you look in scripture, these are the most direct temptations we will ever face. These these feel like an attack and sometimes they are an attack. And this next statement is probably the most important one in this entire series. 
especially as we find ourselves in, in the middle again of a surge of COVID and we feel like we're under attack and, and our families are experiencing tension and we're frustrated with government. We're frustrated with the, the polar opposite in culture that seems to be wanting something different than we want. We're frustrated with work and Zoom and everything seems to be kind of compounding and, and we're, we have nice weather, but we're not allowed to connect connect with each other. We're missing our friends and our relatives and our, and our family. We need to understand this statement. And here it is. A demonic attack is a temptation disguised as a crisis. In other words, a demonic attack is actually a temptation. It looks like a crisis, but the heart of it isn't that physical manifestation. It's what's happening on the inside. It's actually a temptation. And Satan's goal in that attack is to break our hearts to keep us from embracing our destiny and, and to come between us and Jesus. To come between us and Jesus. Now, I want to show you from Scripture some of the stories. I'm going to do some summarizing here. Some of the characters we've already talked about. Job, Peter, Jesus. Notice all three of those men experienced direct temptation, sifted like wheat. Job's uh, life was destroyed on the outside, at least. And Jesus faced off with the devil in the wilderness while he was fasting. He had no food and water. So all of these were experiencing extreme duress, extreme stress, crisis. But the real battle was not out there it was in here. It was in their hearts and in their minds. Let, let's look at Job. Job, we've already talked about. God came and said, well, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan said, well, if you lifted your protection and I was able to take away all of this stuff on the outside, what would happen to him? You know, he wouldn't trust you then. And so what happens in the book of Job, the way it's structured, is that the first chapter or two talks about the devastating losses that Job experienced. And then after that, the entire book, until right at the end, is actually about the real battle, which is the temptations he will face in the mouths of his friends as the enemy comes and voices through them temptations that he's trying to get Job to bite onto. To, to get hooked on. And so these temptations come often in Job in the form of accusation. This is the central uh, temptation of Job. What will happen to Job's heart after this crisis? Again, our temptation, in the, and we would do this in the book of Job, our temptation would be to focus on the external. Oh, but what about all these losses? What about all the heartache? What about all these external things? As critically important as those are, the focus of Job is Job's internal battle with the temptations that arise because of the crisis. Because he was following God, this crisis came upon him, and then he's faced with the temptation. He's led into this temptation. So, the temptations, his, his friends level at him chapter after chapter after chapter. You're doing something wrong. You must be sinning somehow. This is designed to cause what? Kind of a questioning between him and God and to question himself and to feel guilty. They're trying to make him to feel guilty. And then the, those shift sometimes in saying, there's something wrong with you, Job. You are in denial. You are actually corrupt. It's not just that you're doing something wrong. What is this designed to do? Voiced shame on his heart. And then near the end, and you can see him wrestling with this, he is then tempted once he starts being immersed in this accusatory sort of culture around him, he starts accusing. He starts accusing them of not being good friends. He starts accusing God of maybe being unfair. In the beginning, he resists. And near the end, he starts to do and say things that are not as good. So really, this is the temptation for Job. What's, what is the enemy doing? He, he starts the story. Job starts the story close to God, intimate with God, 
What is the design of this accusation? What is the design of this crisis? To come between him and God. To, to sever that connection or to weaken that connection so that Job can't fulfill his destiny. This is what the enemy is doing. Next. Um, well, actually, I'm going to point out here. I got a, a note. Again, notice that the whole focus of Job is not the stuff or even the people or the losses in this particular kind of story. It's the, the heart and mind of Joel, of Job. Is he going to worship God or is he going to falter? Is the enemy going to be able to come between him and his God? Or is this crisis going to draw him nearer to God? That's what's at stake. Now, the way we often pray, we often pray and we often speak as though Satan's attacking our bank account. Satan's attacking our body. Satan's attacking our home, our possessions, our, our relationships, our uh, uh, maybe our you know, the way we're perceived in public, our reputation. But I, I can guarantee you that Satan has not got his crosshairs on your bank account. It's not like, if I can just drain the account, then I will have won. No, he's, he's after what's happening to your heart. Your heart is the focus of the attack. That, that attack is actually a temptation in the form of a crisis. Now you can see this in the life of Peter. We talked about him earlier. Peter, the, the disciple of Jesus, who Jesus said, I will, upon this rock, I will build my church. That Peter, when, when he's sifted like wheat, this happens actually in three different temptations. Remember I said the wheat is sifted in three different phases. He is, he is accused three times around the fireside uh, as Jesus is being tried He's accused three times, you know Jesus, you, you know Jesus, you know Jesus. And the temptation he's being given in that moment, as he's trying to follow Jesus, is will you stay true to him? Will you renounce him? Will you, will you allow distance to be you know, established between you and your God? He's faced with the cost of following Jesus, the danger, the immediate danger in the moment rejection around him and then later as he gave in to those temptations he's tempted to embrace guilt and shame and 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 walk away from Jesus entirely I've noticed this happens again when people get baptized or people try to really take a stand for Jesus or when they really start going deep with the Holy Spirit the enemy again cannot just let that stand and so his first attack often is to bring about a crisis that hides a temptation to let go of our faith, our hope, and our love in our hearts. This is what happens with Jesus in the, in the desert, right? When he's being tempted by the devil. What's the devil trying to do? Well, let's look. The tempter comes to Jesus and says, hey, you're the son of God. Or if you're the son of God, how about you turn this stone into bread? What's he trying to get Jesus to do? To act independently of his father, right? Because that would be distance. Then he brings him to the peak of the temple. Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Satan says, interesting, you should say that. Let's go and let's talk about the word of God. Takes him to the peak of the temple and says, why don't you jump off? Because the word of God says that his angels will carry you and you won't even, you won't even, you know, bump, bump your toe. So let's test it out. What's he doing? He's trying to get Jesus to question, well, did God say that? Did he say that? Is that not, is that not what it means? Can I trust God? Right, of course, Jesus sees right through this, doesn't let it happen. So then what does Satan do? He says, you know, I know that your goal is to achieve, you know, salvation for the world and the kingdom, to, of kingdom come and all that. But you don't have to go through everything the Father's got planned for you. Like you, the, all of this opposition that I'm about to put in front of your life for the next couple of years, all of that can go away if you just worship me. So now what is he doing? He's trying to get Jesus to focus on the goal instead of God, instead, right? The, the, the end instead of the means and all of this. The, all of this can go away if you just worship me. If he worships the devil, 
He's no longer connected to the Father. See, all of this is to create distance, to create a wedge between you and God. That's what your crisis is about. So God tests us in order to strengthen our worship, identity, and trust in him. That's why he leads us into these situations. Just like he said to Peter, right? This is going to be hard. You're going to have a setback, but you're going to come back and you're going to be strong enough to be able to strengthen others. This is why I'm leading you into this. The enemy doesn't test us in order to strengthen us. He tempts us in order to weaken or undermine our worship, our identity in Christ, our trust in God. He's driving a wedge between us and God, whereas God is drawing us nearer. I hope you're seeing what's going on in your life. I hope it feels like as you look at your finances or you look at your job or you look at your friendships or the frustrations you have with the government or COVID or these, these blind sheeple or the conspiracy theorists or the everything in between. I hope you understand that the real battle is not out there. It's in here. It's in your heart. It's in your mind. And the, the, <laughs> I tell you what, you can overcome a problem. And if you lose heart along the way, you've still lost the battle. You, if you overcome a problem, the outward thing, like the body's healed, the, the, the bank account fills back up, the, the job is saved, the relationship, all of that stuff. If you, if you win that battle, but your heart is lost along the way, you've still lost the battle. Because the enemy isn't actually taking aim at those things that are so obvious in the attack. He's got his crosshairs on you and your heart before God. Now, Jesus tells us, this is why he tells us, you're going to want to pray every single day that God doesn't lead you into these. If there are any of these that can be avoided, Father, but not my will, your will, right? This is kind of how he was praying. So if, if, the, if it's possible to avoid any of that, please deliver me ahead of time. But if I have to face it, the pattern of scripture, and this, this you can see in James chapter 4, you can also see the exact same pattern in 1 Peter chapter 5, goes like this. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So what do you do when you find yourself in the middle of an attack? The first thing you do is you humble yourself before God and you submit to him. Why? Because then you've already won before you've made any choice. Your choice is to draw near to God. Your choice is to draw near to him. And because you've done that, you've already won because the purpose of the attack was to cause you to drift away. Okay, so this is the first thing you're going to do. You're going to submit yourselves to God. Why? Because his word will give you power. As you submit to his authority, as you submit to the power of his word, what, you, what, the God, what God says is true, regardless of, of what feels true, you're going to say, this is what I'm clinging to. I submit to you, God. Even before I, I look at this crisis... Even before I, I, I launch into a plan of attack or a counterattack or a plan to lead us out of this thing, even before I address what's physically in front of me, I submit to you, Jesus. Why? Because I win then. I've already won before it even starts. Because the target was my heart and it's in the right place. Okay. Then resist the devil and he will flee from you. Why? Because the battle's won. And because, here's a, here's a key principle, as I submit to God's authority, I can then wield his authority. If I rebel against God and try to resist the devil, he doesn't have to flee. Why? Because I I carry no authority of my own. I only carry his. So if I'm rebelling against God, I'm not under his authority. I can't carry his authority. But the moment I submit to God, 
I have authority over that devil. And then I can do what Jesus did, right? I'm answering with scripture. But at the end of that, at the end of that encounter, quoting God's word, right? To, to, the, to the devil. At the end of that encounter, Jesus says, be gone, go <laughs> like at the end. And the enemy goes. Why? Because in the midst of the temptation, what did Jesus do? He submitted to the father. Beautiful. So good. So good. Jesus, this is so important. Would you please bring it deep into our minds? In Jesus name, please, please, please. I hope this has been really helpful for you, this series. I hope that God has used it to help you see more clearly. Oh, this is one of those common temptations. I'm not doing something wrong. It's just part of being human. Ah, flip it upside down. What, how can I do the opposite? right? Or to see the temptation to do something foolish instead of hiding behind the fact that, well, it's technically not a sin. No, but it takes me a step towards sin. I need to make wise choices to minimize that kind of temptation. And then as I'm following Jesus, understanding that there will be temptations that come my way, not because I've screwed up, not because I'm dumb, not even just because I'm human, but because I'm a threat. And what do I do in those times? I remember that the attack is hiding a temptation. And what's the temptation? To, to, to doubt God, to, to undermine my faith, my hope, and my love, to come between me and Jesus. So what do I do? I submit to him before I do anything else. I humble myself and I submit to him and I receive his word so that I can speak it out and resist the devil and he will flee. So, I would like to do something really quick. I would like to take some time and I want you to think of the struggles that you're facing, the battles that you're in the middle of. Let's do this. Let's do this together. Lord Jesus, I've been so focused on my problem, on the battles I'm fighting, that I've forgotten that the real battle is in my heart. I've been so focused on the external and making that behave and and be what I want it to be that I've forgotten that if I I can win that, I can gain the whole world and I can lose my soul. And I don't want to lose that battle. I want to win that battle. So I submit to you now, Lord Jesus. I reject all the other voices, all the other agendas that I've had. And I present this issue to you. I present myself to you. I surrender to you now. What would you like me to know about this crisis? Would you give me your word in this? It could be a scripture, guys. It could be just an impression, a picture. Jesus, what do you want me to know about my crisis, about my struggle, about this battle? In Jesus' name. Once you've submitted to God and he gives you his word, just like Jesus did, you speak it, you weaponize the word against the enemy. And and you, so if God tells you, Brad, you are secure in me, then I then weaponize it and go, I am secure in Christ, be gone, right? I turn it around. I turn it into an aggressive thing. I'm just quoting God's word and God's word is carrying with it the power to create worlds, the power to bring me through to that breakthrough, that miracle, that fruit, whatever it is I'm craving. And even if that does not happen, I choose not to let my heart be up for grabs. In Jesus name. Amen. Hey, I'm so glad you joined us today. If you enjoyed this content or if it was helpful for you, I'm sure there's someone in your world that would benefit from hearing this same message. If you could refer them to this podcast or share this video with them, it's one way that you can be part of God pushing back the darkness. Just imagine someone who's in the middle of a battle being given the tools to fight that battle on the inside so they can start to win on the outside. That's so exciting. One last thing I want to bring to your attention is a new initiative. I mentioned this in our email called the Online Discipleship Collective. And what this is, is it's an online community that I'm creating that will bring some kind of cutting edge teaching and training around the spirit led life, listening to God, the prophetic, praying for the sick, dealing with the demonic on a deeper level than we can cover on a message like this. And what we're going to do is we're going to create, we've got a Facebook group 
that we're releasing content in probably six or eight times a year will come in the form of live webinars that you can engage in in this Facebook group. You can meet other people exactly on the same journey as you because you're all kind of signed up for this thing. And then there's breakout Zooms where you can get even more intentional coaching, ask questions, that kind of thing. So if you are interested in that, go to our website, manifestcalgary.com and look under your journey and you'll find the online discipleship collect collective. It'll summarize there and show you how to join that Facebook group. But I encourage you, I challenge you, I dare you to go deeper with God, with personalized coaching around these deeper kind of spirit issues. It's going to be so good. Uh, hope to see you over there and have an amazing day.